Hello, my name is Cameron Lineback, and I'll be doing a research presentation on David Garrick, The Restoration, and performing a small piece from Hamlet. Acting is one of the most revered forms of entertainment known to man. We celebrate our stars, our actors, and actresses, and we praise them for the work they do, taking to convince us and our friends that they are not the person whose name they are born with, but that they are someone else different entirely. The very fact that we revere these icons and their performance, as well as judge them on presentation and believability during the performance, says a great deal about not only Western culture, but humanity as a whole. When we think of the good job they do, one might come to wonder how has our society and its judgment upon its actors proceeded throughout the ages, or where exactly this exaltation of actors came from. Well, none so changed acting as a profession, as an art in the Western sense, as much as that of the 1700s Restoration Theatre in England. Often referred to as one of the best times of the profession as a whole, the strides made during this period were phenomenal and instrumental to giving us what we now know as modern Shakespeare and theatrical performance. It was also a time in which it certainly was. Shakespeare was taken up again, but was given reforms in dialogue and performance by Garrick and others after him as we will soon find out. Roles were passed to new generations, and with the traditional scripts, the interpretations of lines and characters tried to produce sensations about them. Acting ranged from formal to realistic. It was also in this time that concepts such as upstaging, crossing, and diction start to become relevant concept in the theater. But this would not have been possible without an especially great leader of the theater industry who helped bring theater to the masses of England and would come to show the rest of the Western world just who was the most apt to produce acting and acting culture in one of the most purest forms. David Garrick was a man built from humble beginnings. He would become best childhood friends with a man known as Samuel Johnson, who would eventually come to say, after Garrick's death, that his profession made him rich and he made his profession respectable. At ten years of age, he was placed under the care of Mr. Hunter, and he may and his master of grammar school at Litchfield, where he resided, and in 1727 showed his predilection for the stage by performing Sergeant Kite in Farquhar's comedy, The Recruiting Officer. He and his companion would go to seek their fortunes in London, and for a while Garrick would take over his family's winemaking business after being left a thousand pound sum of money by his father after his death. But, luckily for the good of theater, and theater history, he would soon abandon this pursuit and turn to writing and acting as a hobby. His first work as a playwright would be Leth, or Aesop in the Shades. It was played at Drury Lane on the 15th of April, 1740, and he became a well-known frequenter in theatrical circles, coming to be friends with people such as Charlie Macklin. But he would set on the path of acting when Garrick entered the acting profession anonymously in March of 1741. Upon the illness of an actor built to take a part, he dashed out on stage as a harlequin at a small, unlicensed theater in Goodman's Fields, under the cover of a mask, to take his place. Other actors would be able to trust for any problems they encountered in the performance. It wasn't until October 1741, however, when Garrick made his London debut at the Outlaw Theatre in Goodman's Fields as Richard III. It is said that at this performance, the women shrieked and fainted from his portrayal, and even his biographer would come to remark that he, threw a new light on elocution and action, he banned his adaptability and way of being able to change emotions in a split second was welcomed by all audiences he entertained. The way of acting is said to be directly influenced from his urging direct observation of life, and was more of a realistic actor than ever. He himself used his body in the fullest way possible, using every inch of his face and body to imitate and become the character. It was said he had intense concentration on his immediate situation. His movement was the movement towards a more realist and less neoclassical approach that had been idealized for so long. So prolific was his repertoire that he was a holder of 96 different roles. Not only that, but from Garrick, the long accepted chant of the past in most of the performances where he started, where there were chants, started to be done away with, and replaced by making speech disguised to be as naturally as possible in verse. This evident in his Shakespearean roles, which he pr practically revolutionized. 
There is no question as to who dominated the English stage betwixt the 1740s and 1776. His acting was so impressive that it would be only a short six years since he started his acting career in 1747 when he would finally take over the Drury Lane Company from Mr. Devant, and in conjunction with James Lacey would promise to bring Drury Lane to more triumphant heights than ever before. He made good on his promise, and from that point forward go on, would go on to make Drury Lane the most profitable and renowned theater in England, in the English world, of which he was, it was no easy task. He was in charge of over 140 actors and stagemen, arranging repertoire, reading, and approving new plays for the company to perform. He transformed the profession through his direction, and it's no wonder he is so respected for it. So respected, in fact, his fame spread beyond England and into the eastern countries of Russia, France, and Italy. Even a Frenchwoman named Suzanne Necker said, I have, in Mr. Garrick's acting, studied the manners of all men, and I have made more discoveries about the human heart than if I had ever gone over the whole of Europe. When he went on tour between 1763 and 1765, he was met with a veritable sense of fame. Few actors had ever received abroad. They include the Duke of Devonshire, the Earl of Ossory, Viscount Palmerston, Earl Spencer, and Lord Camden George Stevens. He was held in pure idolatry by this point in his career, and it is at this point where we can begin to see the similarities between our modern-day cultural praise for actors and that of David Garrick. He raised, as one biographer put it, the character of his profession to a liberal art. Not only was he proficient as an actor, he was also extremely outstanding as a manager of the theater business as well. He saw credited with having all visible light sources removed from the stage to increase brightness and improve the lamps and reflectors, while also making the popular continental system, which would make light ladders rotate to direct light away or towards the stage whenever it was needed. Unfortunately, the legend could not live forever, and he died close to his 62nd birthday. It was just as grand as his personality and contributions to the theater. He is buried in Westminster Abbey in Poet's Corner. The procession was said to be as long as the Strand, as from the Strand to Westminster Abbey, meaning the crowd would have had to have been over 5,000 feet long. His tomb was enshrined the words, Shakespeare and Garrick, like twin stars shall shine, and earth irradiate with a beam divine. So what can be said of David Garrick, you ask? A great many things. From his revolutionary acting style, to his improvements in theatrical management, to his prolific acting career. Really, what is it that can't be said about this man? A modern-day star who engrossed audiences that he captivated them as far away as the foreign lands of France, Italy, and Russia, and was given applause everywhere he treaded, setting out to follow his dreams of playwriting, acting, and dramatic criticism, while drawing crowds of screaming men and women alike to see his performances. And someone who brought the acting profession to the light of day, giving it the modern flair, sensibility, and practicality that the art deserved. For that we should be eternally grateful, that such a man was able to take up the mantle, that is acting, and transform it into the art and form we all know and love today. Now I will recite To Be or Not to Be in the style of David Garrick. To be or not to be, that is the question. Whether it is nobler in mind to suffer the slings and arrows of outrageous fortune, or to take arms against a sea of troubles, and by opposing in them, to die, to sleep no more, and by sleep to say we end the heartache, and the thousand natural shocks that flesh is heir to. Tis a consummation devoutly to be wished. To die, to sleep, to sleep perchance to dream. Ay, there's the rub, for in that sleep of death what dreams may come. When we have shuffled off this mortal coil must give us pause. There's the respect that makes calamity of so long life, for who would bear the whips and scorns of time, the oppressor's wrong and the proud man's contumely, the pangs of despised love, the law's delay, the insolence of office, and the spurns that patient merit of thy unworthy takes. When he himself might his quietus make, what a bare botkin? Who would these fardels bear, to grunt and sweat under a weary life? 
but that the dread of something after death, the undiscovered country from those whose born no traveler returns, puzzles the will and makes us rather bear those ills we have than fly to others we know not of. Thus conscience does make cowards of us all, and thus the native hue of resolution is sicklied over with the pale cast of thought and enterprises of great pith and moment. With this regard their currents turn awry and loose the name of action. Soft on you now, the fair Ophelia, Nymph in thy orisons. Be all my sins remembered. Thank you. I hope you enjoyed the performance. <laughs>